The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we tried to set up the slideshow earlier, but uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, for them to appear, they're everywhere. Nagarjuna said, every atom is a hundred Buddhas dancing and laughing uh, throughout the universe, and thus the entire universe is filled with enlightened beings. Nonetheless, they wouldn't appear on our slideshow till we gathered a great deal of merit. So we had to spend about two hours, but I think Chris is perhaps uh, got it set, set out here, although I think he's put it somewhere towards the middle or towards the end, I'm not sure, but we'll leave that up to him. Very great honor for me to be here on Founders Weekend, actually uh, this uh, year, 2006, my first visit to the TS, and when I first started here was in 1986, 20 years ago, and I've come at least once a year every time since then, uh, often twice a year, so it's been very wonderful for me to have that connection. And I have many friends here and at uh, the other TS lodges around the country. I think uh, for my own, my own experience or my own training, although I've studied and read largely from all the different fields, starting with uh, Sufism and Hinduism, Taoism, or probably my very strong uh, reading focuses in my teen years and what not, after I actually started practicing more, I went more towards the Tibet side, uh, not because I found it superior to the others, but simply because of the wonderful abundance of great Tibetan masters, um, largely thanks to uh, the murderous uh, Chairman Mao and the communist Chinese. You know, there's a wonderful book right now called Mao, Chairman Mao, The Unknown Story. It starts out with, he was born in a village in western China, educated to be a civil servant, went on to murder 70 million people in peacetime, more than the total number murdered by all wars of the <laughs> 20th century. But uh, the book starts like that, but uh, goes on to tell his life and how he came to murder the 70 million. And of course, it's a terrible thing to murder 70 million, but from my side, uh, every uh, cloud has a silver lining, and that silver lining was, of course, the Tibetans were pushed out of their country and the great lamas thrown across the, the, the modern world. And so they first came to Nepal and India, Sikkim, Bhutan, and so forth, and from there, as refugees, moved elsewhere. Of course, that was uh, excesses of a violent time. When we think back of it, we think it's... Uh, something very terrible, and of course it is terrible, but the 20th century was a very rough century, World War I, World War II. I mean, just the bird flu after World War I wiped out three million more than the entirety of World War I, 21 million I think it, it wiped out. So it was a, somewhat of an intense century, all told, and I was, uh, had the good fortune to see the last half of it, which was not quite so tough as <laughs> the first half. But because of uh, what happened in China, then China taking Tibet, then the Tibetan lamas fled, and because of them fleeing, then of course those of us in the West with some sort of karmic connection had the auspicious opportunity to meet many of those great masters and to study with them. I once discussed this kind of slant on the situation with the Dalai Lama, and he replied to me, uh, he said that sometimes for the purity of a spiritual tradition, you build temples, and sometimes for the purity of a spiritual tradition, you have to tear temples down. And I think uh, probably our world toward, towards the last half of uh, the, the middle of the last century, and as we went deeper into the last century, became ever increasingly sensitive, uh, sort of politically, certainly militarily with nuclear power, financially more delicate, uh, environmentally more delicate, and uh, as a result, I think Tibet perhaps played the role of being the safety valve, and a bit of steam blew out from there, and hopefully that will have the effect of turning things around. According to Buddhist prophecy, and uh, Madame Blavatsky was very much into prophecy and the Kalachakra Tantra, she was uh, very attracted to those aspects of uh, Tibet and Tibetan uh, mysticism. According to that prophecy, 
in the not near, not too distant future, we will come to a crossroads. And uh, at that crossroads, we will either enter into a thousand years of darkness or a thousand years of golden age. And it is possible that the last two or three generations could have resulted in the thousand years of darkness. It only took someone hitting the little red button on either side or um, any of another, uh, any of a number of other factors could have created that disaster. But it's said that if we all work hard and uh, collect lots of good karma, become uh, bigger, better, wiser, and smarter, all the humans on the planet, then we will get the thousand years of the golden age. So myself, I'm uh, honored to have uh, met with those great lamas, and I hope that in some way, uh, things I've done with my own life will be able to contribute uh, in some small way to things going in that positive direction. I think Madame Blavatsky was very much uh, a great being pushing things uh, in that golden era direction. But of course, um, other forces are pushing the other way. The Dalai Lama on another occasion said, our world is in a very precarious state, and it's up to each individual to do his or her best. We can't talk about world peace. We can talk about individual peace. We can't talk about world solutions. We can talk about individual solutions. When we get enough individual peace and enough individual solution, we, get, uh, we move towards world peace, world solutions. And I think Madame Blavatsky made a great contribution to that. Uh, we often forget that when she came into the world, um, we in the West were very condescending towards all other traditions. We used names for them like savages, pagans, barbarians, and so on and so forth. Um, Wherever we went, we essentially did our best to undermine their cultures. It was an imperialistic age, not just for us, but elsewhere around the world. But Madame Blavatsky really was uh, very much a breakthrough thinker when she not only pronounced that all traditions of the world have a great deal of truth to share and are founded in truth and uh, encourage beings to evolve towards truth. And um, it sounds very commonplace to us today, but that, at that time, it was a very radical thing to say. But not only did she say it, wherever she went, she got thousands and often tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people to listen to her. She became one of the most highly respected and regarded um, spiritual peoples of her age. Um, of course, a lot of uh, people, also, there was also a lot of uh, negative uh, response, because obviously not everyone wanted to hear a message of that nature. Not everyone wanted the world to move in that direction. There were the cultural and spiritual imperialists who felt that they should have the dominating position. Uh, we who have, uh, those of us who have learned much from Asian traditions, uh, all of us have a lot, uh, a great debt to her. We owe her uh, a great debt. And the Tibetans in particular, her work, when she started working, nobody knew much about Tibet at all. And she was really the first person to speak about Tibet with, with, uh, with praise, with beautiful language, with exaltation, and to speak well of the Tibetans. Before her, um, everyone else basically in the West, uh, either we didn't know anything about her, or if we did, we just basically thought of them as uh, provincial peoples located somewhere to the north of India who didn't really have much going for them. And she brought out the mystical side of Tibet and the spiritual side of Tibet, popularized it, and created something of a Tibetan uh, enamorment movement. <laughs> and that Tibetan enamorment movement led to people studying Tibetan and learning the language and then coming to see what Tibet did and did not have uh, for cultural, spiritual assets. Those who came after her, many of the great translators, people like Evans Wentz uh, and so forth, uh, who did a lot of the early work, always mention her and give credit to her back in the 1920s, that they, they owed much of what they themselves learned to the, the direction she had pointed 
and the pace she had set. So for me, it's, uh, when I was here last year, Betty and I discussed the idea of taking a TS trip to Tibet next year, to Blavatsky's Tibet. Um, someone said to me today, did Blavatsky ever go to Tibet? <laughs> and it is a, an open question. Officially, she did not. Uh, she was a Russian traveling in British India. And that was the time of the Great War. And uh, all uh, white peoples were banned from Tibet from the year 1802. Basically, because the British from the south had chopped away at Tibet's borders, taking Ladakh, Lahul, Spiti, Kanor, uh, you know, Darjeeling, we say, in India. Actually, it was Dorjeeling in Tibet. All of these parts of South Tibet fell to the British colonialists. And on the north, the Russian Tsar was pushing east at the uh, rate of several miles a day and swallowed up all of the Tibetan Buddhist areas, the Mongol regions of the north, throughout Siberia, Tuvo, Buryat, and so forth. And um, the final result was in the early 1800s, the Tibetans said, uh, these white fellows are a little dangerous. <laughs> They come in and ask to trade, and before you know it, uh, they map out all of the um, trade routes, and then later they send in their armies using those maps, and they conquest and they colonize. So they made the Tibetan government made the rule in 1802 that uh, white peoples wanting to come to Tibet had to get a personal letter directly from the Lhasa government. They couldn't come in without that. And through the 1800s, that uh, built up and became ever stronger as the Russian Empire continued to expand and the British colonies continued to become more and more forceful. And uh, in India, of course, India became a full-fledged colony and actually became part of the empire. It was actually, Victoria was first declared uh, an empress when uh, her son Edward, uh, traveling in India, declared her from India the empress of India. <laughs> So the, the uh, Tibetans became very concerned and very nervous, naturally, around foreign intents. And uh, both Russia uh, in all of its eastern sections had Tibetan Buddhist areas, and India in the south, ruled by Britain, all of its north, Himalayas, all the Himalayan regions, were all Tibetan Buddhist areas. So both of them agreed neither should take over Tibet because it would give the two, and both were enemies in the conquest of Central Asia. So or we should say combatants <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the conquest of Central Asia. And so both agreed neither should take Tibet and it should remain uh, something of a buffer zone. If someone took it, it would give them too much of a spying uh, capability in those other regions. Um, particular Lhasa, for instance, the three great monasteries, and we'll see some of them in the slideshow today. Uh, whole areas of eastern Russia, uh, the peoples born there, being Tibetan Buddhist Mongolians, by birth had hereditary right to just show up and demand free education. And uh, all of eastern Russia, therefore, was uh, largely inhabited by peoples who went to Tibet to train. Similarly, people from Ladakh, Lahul, Spiti, when they, when they completed or at least got fairly developed in their own uh, monasteries, com uh, completed much of the training, they could switch to Lhasa for the higher uh, monastic universities and the higher trainings. So both British and Russians were very concerned that neither should take Tibet. Similarly, China started taking a real interest because, of course, in those days, Tibet was an independent country, but Western China was largely Buddhist. And in fact, the Manchus, who are a Mongol tribe and who conquered uh, China in about 1844, I believe, uh, were very concerned because if anyone took Tibet, then, of course, they were Tibetan Buddhist, and the Dalai Lama was the spiritual head of all of Manchu China, of all of the Manchu Mongols. And, uh, as a result, they too pressed that no one should take Tibet. So all three were very concerned, and therefore the ability of white peoples uh, to Europeans or Americans to travel into Tibet was very, very limited. It used to be said that nobody went there, and if they did, thereafter, they uh, wrote a dozen books about their adventures and about their travels. Um, it is possible that Madame Blavatsky did secretly go in, because she spent a lot of time in Shimla. And Simla was, in the old days, the far southwest of Tibet, not so far really from Mount Kailash. Uh, I've taken several trips there, and in our slideshow we'll see 
uh, one of the a few shots from one of the places, one of the uh, passes we go over, the 18,600 foot pass, which uh, does demand a bit for your average kind of uh, morning jogger. <laughs> but uh, Shimla uh, used to be part of old Tibet in the, the southwest and had been taken over by uh, British India, I believe in 1821 or 1822, something like those years. Family Lahul and uh, Kunu used to uh, be part of Tibet and uh, had, had been part of actually the old Tibetan kingdom of Guge. And today in India, some of the best monks in Drepon Losaling are from Guge, and there's actually one of the 24 departments in Drepon Losaling Monastery has a department called Guge Kamsan. All, all the monks from those areas taken over at that time still go down. Legally, they're Indian, but uh, ethnically and spiritually, they're Tibetan. So uh, Madame Blavatsky's great introduction to the Tibetans began with her time there with Colonel Alcott. Whether or not she went into Tibet or whether she spent all of that time in Shimla and just uh, exchanged spiritual ideas with those beings who came through there. Now, in those times, Shimla was an important pilgrimage place and the Tibetans coming out, coming down to uh, essentially uh, Sopema is a Tibetan name for it, but it's uh, uh, Rawalsar. They come down to Shimla and head up, uh, pull a right and go for a few days and you come to the bottom of the Manali Valley and head up into the mountains and you come to the Lotus Lake with a great Padmasambhava uh, achieved enlightenment with his female student, Mandarava. Still there today, that's a great Tibetan temple center. And if you travel through the Himalayas, a wonderful, wonderful temple town to visit. Uh, beautiful hill station. Um, and uh, above it, all the caves where Padmasambhava meditated. And Tibetans since that time, since about 720 or so, have continued to meditate. And um, so that's where Madame Blavatsky essentially got her introduction to Tibet and learned about it, met many great Tibetan masters, and where she, she and Alcott, uh, well, I shouldn't say took an interest. They had spent a lot of time before that elsewhere in India and possibly had other direct connections. Certainly, they, they had been to Sri Lanka and uh, through, um, various Buddhist, uh, other Buddhist regions. But it was uh, the closest she got to the Tibetan border, and actually it was inside what would have been pre-1820s uh, Tibet. Um, did she or did she not go in? Well, there is no word from her that she did. Uh, but there's a, some, there is a school of thought that thinks, yes, she indeed did. Because uh, a number of peoples in those days did disguise themselves and did travel around Tibet on pilgrimage. Usually like uh, Alexander David Neal, for instance, uh, disguise, who disguised herself as kind of a mad old woman and made herself all dirty and rough and made herself look like a provincial country bumpkin and uh, slightly mad and pretended she couldn't talk and would just go from pilgrimage place to pilgrimage place, being very careful not to let her identity known. So it's thought that uh, Blavatsky may have done something like that. In her time, though, it would have been very dangerous had she said, yes, she did, because she never again would have been allowed to go back to India. Not only that, everyone she met in Tibet would have gotten in, in serious trouble. The Tibetans took their closed door policy very close, and not, even though Tibetans are a rather compassionate people and a Buddhist people, they did regard any infringement uh, on the part of their own uh, local governors and uh, uh, road controllers and so forth as an act of treason. And not that much earlier, in about 1875 or 1880, Sharat Sandra Das had gone in, and uh, he had traveled under a document issued by the Panchen Lama, uh, again a person uh, of whom Madame Blavatsky speaks in depth and, and speaks very enamoringly. And uh, he, he had gone in with a document from the Panchen Lama, traveled through uh, out central Tibet and throughout uh, Lhasa and all the regions, and then returned to Darjeeling. Later it was learned that in fact he was in the pay of the British government. And so even though he was an academic and a scholar, like so many American academics and Canadian scholars studying abroad, they occasionally will take a little task from the government to do a little um, look, uh, look at what's going on in places, uh, stipends. And that's what he did. Unfortunately, it did backfire. And the Panchen Lama's guru, actually the Panchen Lama at the time was a very young man, uh, was arrested for treason. 
And so it had a disastrous effect and the, the treason was the only sentence in most Buddhist, Buddhist countries in the East that carried the death sentence. So he was actually put to death for issuing that visa uh, for endangering state security. And uh, Madame Blavatsky came along not long after that. So even had she gone in, uh, there's very little chance she ever would have publicly announced it or written about it or let people know directly. Nonetheless, until today, there is the legend that from that time, she did, uh, did in fact go in, did travel around, and that's how she got to know so much about Tibet. I think people think it kind of logically, where there's smoke, there's fire. And because she knew so much about Tibet, people felt that must have been how she got it. Because uh, otherwise, Simla was, having been at that time under British rule for about 50 years or so, 60 years, had become less Tibetanized and more Indian and Britainized. Um, I think one of the main books in the early days, and I brought a copy along with me, just in people's don't know it, H.P.B. Vlavatsky, Tibetan Tuku by Jeffrey Barborka, which is one of the uh, very important early books on Tibetan culture and is one of the ones that really tells a lot about what was going on with that whole part of the world and what was going on in Tibet spiritually and uh, very carefully drawing from Blavatsky's writings, kind of hints of what she knew and then elucidating that and uh, showing how the whole Tibetan tradition works spiritually. But uh, going, she basically calls all of Blavatsky's uh, secret doctrines, writings and other sources, uh, interviews with her, letters with her, and so forth, and drawing on those sources creates the picture, and really the first in-depth picture of the, the Tibetan spiritual world. Of course, today, it's a lot later, we can look at it and say, well, that uh, it doesn't really all come up to modern linguistic and philosophical ways of looking at things. But when we translate anything from a foreign language into our own, we put it into a cultural setting, which is... Uh, accessible to our readers. And I think a lot of the distance is created by that. I remember with David Regal, a very dear friend who's a theosophist, and when I had him doing the Sanskrit on my Kala Chakra book, uh, he was working on some of the early Blavatsky writings. And a lot of the early uh, academics poopod Blavatsky for a word called Dode and Gude, and books called Dode and Gude, from which she had gotten much of her uh, learning. And they commented that no such book exists in the Tibetan world. In fact, Dode means the, the uh, uh, compendium of sutras. Sutras means public discourses. Uh, Jude means compendium of tantras or secretly taught Buddhist discourses. So the fact that uh, she had spelled those two words in something of an antiquated, old-fashioned way and hadn't written it the way we're used to seeing it in modern uh, Wiley system transliteration and so forth, had sort of thrown everyone for a loop and made the academics come up with the idea that no such books existed in the Tibetan world. Actually, I'd never heard the debate myself until David pointed it out to me and pulled out some paragraphs on it and then pulled out those two words and showed what they were and asked if I knew what they were in Tibetan. And of course, because I knew what they were in Tibetan, and just the way he pronounced them and said them without looking at the spelling, then that immediately clarified why that whole situation had come about. Um, the Theosophical Society has helped a lot with a lot of the things happened to Tibetans after they came uh, into exile in India. Of course, uh, the Key to the Middle Way, which was the Dalai Lama's first book published in English, was published by Quest Books here in Wheaton. On the Dalai Lama's first trip in America, he came by Chicago and uh, met with the TS leaders, and the next year actually came and stayed here and visited. And so. The link has been strong. In India, uh, the TS helped with a lot of fundraising from ADR and helped with the world organization uh, raise, because we suddenly had 100, 150 refugees just pouring across the borders and into India, a third world country, uh, 10 years after their independence from, uh, 12 years after the independence from England. So a kind of a very impoverished third world country and very little resources. So the TS worldwide 
and did large fundraisings for them. I think uh, the Argentina TS Society in particular was very strong, uh, but uh, from England, very strong, and uh, also here in America. So undoubtedly, many Tibetan lives were saved by that effort. When they came out, uh, most Tibetans made their life making, earning 20 cents a day, um, working on the roads, and just having basically an umbrella to sit under when it rained or got sun, and uh, putting their kids, just tying them on a little tether to a stick with an umbrella over their head for the 12 hours a day they'd work for this uh, 15 or 20 cents. So at that time, everyone was dying from uh, a lot of tuberculosis, which didn't exist in Tibet and was very contagious in uh, the Indian uh, climate. And it's very common with all Indians, actually. It's, uh, almost all Indians test positive for TB because everyone's contacted it and has the antibody to it. And so Tibetans, of course, uh, had no resistance, so many, many of them died, probably as many as 20 or 30 percent of them. But uh, the TS was very instrumental in coming in with uh, some, uh, some help and clothes and money and food and so on and so forth, so saved many, many lives. They also helped spiritually through uh, helping to preserve their books and uh, helping with publishing and other such activities, helping to reestablish the monasteries and, in little ways and uh, sponsor monks and uh, sponsor the whole re-education and stable, uh, settling and uh, re-establishing of destroyed traditions. Back in Tibet, uh, the Cultural Revolution, this is in 59, Cultural Revolution in China erupted in 1966. So then full-scale destruction took place throughout China and therefore throughout Tibet. In Tibet, I think, of 6,500 monasteries, all but 13 were destroyed. Their inhabitants either killed or imprisoned. Even those 13 were closed and the inhabitants killed or imprisoned. Uh, but And those 13 were turned into either warehouses or uh, military barracks. And uh, this continued until 1980 when uh, Deng Xiaoping came in and said uh, this anti-intellectualism has to go. It's uh, not a good thing. And actually, it's quite interesting in China, throughout China during that whole period, there was very little education anywhere other than the little red book. Uh, I once heard the president of China who went to prison in 1966. His daughter, I think, was nine years old and her school had finished. and so. Thereafter, she just had underground education. And later, after, not until Deng Xiaoping came in, did she have any more education for that whole 14 or 15 year period. And she, she once uh, heard her speak in an interview and she said, this is really a great lost period of Chinese history. And until today, Chinese still do not like to talk about it. It's something that I think all Chinese are ashamed of and they feel terrible about. And it's, I think, a little bit like the Holocaust with the Jews. Um, it was very difficult for them for many years after, after the end of World War II for them to talk openly or honestly about it. It was something that was an object of terrible uh, shame and pain for them, and same for China. And in Tibet, uh, that destruction went on. But then Deng Xiaoping brought it to an end, and in the 80s, Tibet started to be rebuilt. And uh, so now we have about 500 of those monasteries are rebuilt. And although none of them are anywhere as big or as glorious as they were in the uh, olden days, nonetheless, they are up and active. And Tibetan culture, uh, anywhere except the cities, is doing pretty well. The cities, of course, have suffered a lot from uh, mass immigration because Tibet only had about 6 million people. Now, Tibet, uh, Chinese did discuss this in various ways. Because in 1967, a year after Cultural Revolution, they changed, began, they changed the border of eastern Tibet and moved it westward by several hundred miles. So now the population of Tibet Autonomous Region is about 2 million. But about 4 million Tibetans live in the other eastern parts, which are now either Sichuan Province or Qinghai uh, uh, Province, Hunan Province, these other provinces. But um, in central Tibet in particular, um, immigration has been very strong with, I think, now maybe two or three million, four million Chinese living and only two million Tibetans. Lhasa in particular, well, you know, is a little disappointing. I think there's 1.2 million Chinese and only 300,000 Tibetans. So the old city has pretty well disappeared. Nonetheless, it is still very much a sacred country, and when you go uh, 200 yards off the road, you get back to old Tibet. So when we travel in Tibet next year on the Theosophical Tour, those of you who come, we will mostly go to those areas, those places, which are still very uh, 
quite pure in terms of Tibetan spiritual culture, and um, where a lot of practice, study, uh, practice and study, meditation, and so forth is done. Now, I thought, uh, yeah, we'll watch the, do something with a slideshow here. I have to find Chris and find out. Uh, we have to get to the first slide. There we are. Beautiful. Yeah, I was recently speaking in Dallas, and I, in Dallas I was at uh, the Crow Museum, and they've got the old photographs that uh, Newark Museum in New Jersey collected. And those photographs were mostly taken between about 1890 and 1920, but one of them is of Lhasa, and it's this grand picture of the Potala from uh, 1916, I think. And at that time, there were only about 10,000 Tibetans living in the valley in the city of Lhasa. But uh, this great site, which is mentioned uh, many times in uh, Madame Blavatsky's writings, was one of her kind of great places of mind, I think, a kind of great inspiration. You know, the Dalai Lama uh, always lived there. He's got those five little rooms on the top under the little, uh, those little golden roofs off to the left. That's his personal apartment. And if you come down one level, it's uh, mostly temples and chapels for study and practice and whatnot. And the monks of Namgyal would do prayers and rituals. Come down another, and that's the residence of the 120 monks of Dalai Lama's private monastery, Namgyal Trasan. Come down another level, and that's the uh, mostly national archives, sort of like the American Library of Congress, except Tibetan equivalent. So all of the books and uh, historical records and whatnot were all kept in there. Down further are the big meeting rooms where the Tibetan government would meet uh, to make important decisions. And before, in the older days, if you come out front was the little city of Lhasa with about 10,000 people. And behind was the vi village of Shoal. And the sixth Dalai Lama, who wasn't a monk but was a famous lover of Tibet, used to sneak down those steps behind every night and go back and um, sing and dance in the taverns and make love to the young maidens of the Lhasa Valley and write uh, love poetry. Until today, I think every Tibetan knows his love poetry by heart. He's perhaps the most popular of all the Dalai Lamas in terms of poetry. <laughs> Some of the others are appreciated more their, for their philosophy, but his songs are known to all. And probably when we go in Tibet, uh, uh, you know, on the TS trip, we can uh, request some of the, when we stop to have some. Tibetans mostly drink alcohol made from a, kind of a beer, a little bit like beer, a little bit like wine made from barley flour. So when we drink barley, barley wine, we can have them uh, sing some of their love songs for us, written by the sixth Dalai Lama. They don't sound great in English, but they all have some kind of tantric meaning to them. That uh, vast commentaries are like things like, uh, you know, when we I've heard about Guru Yoga, I try to practice it. I work and work to get the mind of get the the image of my Guru visualized in my mind's eye, but it slips away. But amazingly, so easily, the face of my lover comes back. <laughs> 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 now, of course, uh, Tibetans give that a, lamas give that a, t he probably just meant it as a simple love song, or he may have meant it as a tantric song, but if it were to be given a, man, a, a, a tantric meaning, then it would be that uh, the teacher is an important, uh, in a, is an important uh, vessel or a carriage leading us to enlightenment, but once we get to enlightenment, we have to look to the, to the true lover the real guru, which is the experience of enlightenment itself. So some say, oh no, the Dalai, the Sikh Dalai Lama is just proclaiming his own enlightenment and no need to look so much more for the guru, for the words of the great master and the face of the great master. Now it's his own enlightenment state is his guru. So we can click over. The steps going up are rather wonderful. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds of them and you get to the top and then you enter the building, then you go up a whole series of tiny little ladders with uh, very slippery wooden steps. In the olden days, uh, when Dalai Lama would sit on the top on a throne with his monks and uh, 20, 30, 40, 50,000, a tribe would come in those kind of numbers for blessings on pilgrimage, uh, very often get 10 or 20 or 30,000. Then the whole bunch of them would all go up in single file like that. And he'd sit there on a throne like this. We can do it at the end, I'll show you. He'd reach down. <laughs> And either give everyone a hand blessing if, uh, uh, if they were, you know, 
co if they were like old people and they'd like to be touched on the head, otherwise with other people, he'd use kind of a stick with a little blessing tassel on the end. And the blessing tassel had like little snippets of robes from all the previous Dalai Lamas and hair, little snippets of hair from the great gurus of the past and go ding, like that. And the whole 20, 30,000 of them would go through. And undoubtedly, when Blavatsky was in India, that kind of mass blessing thing was something she would have witnessed with the great lamas on pilgrimage. Because even today, when any lama comes anywhere, uh, just uh, Tibetans are not, and the Central Asians, so they're not so enthusiastic for hearing long philosophical talks. They more want to get blessing, and they also want to get a blessing pill, something you can take home and eat and <laughs> share with your uh, relatives and friends. Recently, Dalai Lama in, uh, in August was in Mongolia, and the Wrestling Association was his host organization. And so they are, they're kind of intellectual types, wrestlers, as you know. <laughs> and so they uh, requested large, you know, long kind of public teaching things. And I was sitting there, and this little Mongolian lady is sitting there. What's he talking about? She says to the other lady, oh, to the other lady, oh, I think it's like something about philosophy. She says, oh, well, when's he going to finish and get on to giving us the blessing and the pills? <laughs> Of course, Tibetans are smarter, they're more accustomed to these blessing ceremonies than Mongolians, because Mongolians were under Soviets for 75 years, so for them, they're just getting back into the swing of it. Tibetans always bring along a bottle of wine or a bottle of whiskey, so if the talk goes on too long, they kind of <laughs> <laughs> have something to help the hours slip by. <laughs> Can you go to the next one? Inside of the Potala, it's uh, said to be a mass palace of a thousand rooms, but all the upper chambers are all temples. So this is my personal favorite. It's the chapel of the seventh Dalai Lama, who is also my own personal favorite. His uh, book of poetry was one of the first books I translated, uh, Songs of Spiritual Change, and uh, later it was republished as Meditations to Transform the Mind, which is taken from another part of his title. Uh, Snowline often republishes books with a different title, thinking if the first one, you know, uh, went and the second one, uh, he, you can always improve it and it'll go even better. But he was my favorite. He wrote wonderful spiritual poems, things like uh, Image of a Sun Shining High in the Heavens, We're All Living Beings to Shine Radiant Love Equally Upon All Other Living Beings. How excellent. Image of an Eagle Flying High in Space, Where We All to Fly Free in the Space of Vast Infinity Without Grasping or Holding. How excellent. The image of a rainbow, clear, dazzling, where we all to shine in our meditation like the rainbow in the sky. How excellent. And so on. He goes on with this very wonderful poem. But he wrote uh, something like 5,000 poems in his life, but all more overtly spiritual, less uh, kind of lover this and lover that kind of poem, like his uh, predecessor had done. Perhaps because, you know, the Sixth Dalai Lama, having uh, been a little bit of a rascal, brought the ire of the Mongols who said, oh, he's not the real Dalai Lama. So they invaded, arrested him, and put a puppet on the throne, which of course led to a civil war because no Tibetan likes a foreign country interfering with their Dalai Lama institution. So then that led to a civil war, and uh, then the seventh Dalai Lama came back. So I think he thought, well, the last guy's poetry was good, but it did create a civil war. <laughs> it did lead to an invasion and a civil war. But that's one of my, that chapel is three statues of him, plus the mummy that was uh, made of him after he died. Tibetans make mummies of their Dalai Lamas, Panchen Lamas, and Genden Tripa, head of Galupa. And so the, all of the Dalai Lama mummies from the fifth on still exist, and they're in the Potala. Uh, first to fourth, they didn't make mummies. They just started with the fifth. And the first two present Panchen Lama were always mummified. Uh, by modern count in Tibet, the fourth, because uh, later the Chinese wanted to elevate the Panchen Lama status so they called the first one the fourth by giving him three previous lives and saying, uh, calling well, that his previous life. I was noticing in uh, the TS library up in Milwaukee last night that uh, the four previous lives of um, uh, Annie Basant. Well, that's what they did with Pension Lama. <laughs> and so the first became the fourth. But they mummified from the first or fourth Pension Lama up until the one who died in 1989. Of course, after. He died. They all got, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, they got very angry and uh, destroyed all of the Panchen Lama uh, mummies because they thought they had the Panchen Lama working for them because uh, they had caught him as a young kid and held him very closely and made him sort of act uh, 
read speeches for them and stuff as a teenager, and he didn't really have any art choice. But in 1964, he, read a, he was supposed to read a speech sort of supporting the Chinese uh, invasion. And he said just the opposite, that things had gone terribly and were going worse, and there was no hope. And so unless Tibetans looked to the Dalai Lama then, uh, and just held their breath for a while, things would be going much, much worse for the next couple of decades. And he said, uh, you shouldn't expect to see me again. I'll certainly be arrested tonight and probably killed. And so that was the last that was seen of him for 15 years. Everyone presumed him dead. And the Chinese got very angry and destroyed all the mummies of all of his predecessors. <laughs> So a way of getting back. You be good or we'll destroy your mummies of your previous lives. <laughs> anyway, the Dalai Lamas, they still kept them for some reason. Uh, I think Chairman Mao personally made the, made the order during the, uh, during the uh, Cultural Revolution that the Potala couldn't be harmed. So next one. So there's three statues of them, one at eight years old, I think, one at 21 or 22, and one the year before he died. So that's the, one of them as a little boy there below, and that's the one above as I'm older, and the one over in the corner is the one of them as a young man. So next. The other uh, great thing in Lhasa, of course, is Zhou Kong. Also was not destroyed quite uh, by accident. Uh, the, the, it had been built in about 630, that uh, King Sung Sen Gampo, the emperor who had uh, created uh, unified all of Tibet in those days and made an empire that went all the way from western China to Afghanistan, down deep into India, and all up covering the Silk Road. Uh, large parts of Mongolia were invaded. The largest continuous land empire ever seen uh, in our western world, uh, out even larger than the um, Roman Empire. But anyway, he married uh, two foreign women, both Buddhists, one from Nepal and one from China. So in the Cultural Ch Revolution, China, they were supposed to destroy anything non-Chinese, directly non-Chinese linked in Tibet. Anything with a direct link to China should not be destroyed. So the uh, generals thought that this had been built for the China of the two foreign princess, Buddhist princesses. One from, the first was from Nepal and the second was from China. And so they got the temples uh, confused and they destroyed the Chinese temple and preserved the <laughs> Nepali temple. So this was one built for the Nepali temple. <laughs> I think I've always told Tibetans, you know, your big hope is your, uh, your occupiers are Chinese communists. <laughs> it is, does give them an advantage. <laughs> They're always doing the wrong thing. But anyway, it's a very beautiful temple, and we will be going to there on the trip. Now, again, Blavatsky mentions that many times in her writings because it was the center of all Buddhist Asia, and uh, undoubtedly many of the Buddhist pilgrims she met while they were living in Shimla would have been from, if they came from eastern Tibet, they would certainly go through. There, there, there are very set kind of pilgrimage routes, standard pilgrims, pilgrimages that the Central Asians love. And, Every year, uh, once in their life, they like to make the Mount Kailash one, which actually next year I'm taking one there in, uh, in August. But that's a tough one, a real tough one. So if you go to Kailash, you go down there, past there, particularly if you're old school or Nyingma, down to Simla, then over to Rawaltsar, to Guru Padmasambhava's caves up there. Then you come up the other way, north of Kailash, and come back. So they would have gone through the temple on the way out. But built in about 630, and it's considered one of the great uh, marvels of ancient architecture. And by the way, the Potala is marked by UNESCO as one of the seven man-made wonders of the world because this enormous thing built uh, at that time with absolutely no mechanical equipment. Um, and uh, according to Tibetan sayings, you know, the, they used uh, lamas with telekinesis to levitate the large rocks into place at the top because there was no way, other way to get them up. They tried, you're not supposed to use magical powers uh, unnecessarily, because uh, it's like showing off. But if all else fails, then you can. So according to legend, that's how they did. So next one. Padmasambhava, who came to Tibet 100 years later, of course, and uh, we'll be going to many of his places. Again, Blavatsky mentions him many times as a source of great inspiration. But what he actually wrote and taught, we don't really know, because it was so long ago. And much of what has been preserved has been through treasure text, either through dreams or meditation visions and so on. But nonetheless, uh, these are all incredited to him or inspired by him. So they're a very great being. Uh, 
and we can actually click that. There's a way you can, no, maybe you can't see, no, can't see on the screen. Okay, otherwise you could zoom, blow it up a little bit. But uh, a very great master, again, and considered to be emanation of Shenrezi, as is the Dalai Lama. The prayer to him begins, uh, Dharmakaya is Amitabha, Sambhogakaya is Shenrezi, Nirmanakaya is Padmasambhava. And I noticed in Tulku in Tibet, there's a passage where they quote Madame Blavatsky is discussing those three kayas and the doctrine of three kayas. The infinity of being, where mind becomes vastness, uh, how mind manifests on the etheric plane or the higher plane, uh, which can only be perceived by aryas or saints, and finally manifests in the ordinary world in ways that can be perceived uh, t for the training of ordinary living beings. So means on the infinite plane, Amitabha, on the um, etheric plane, Shenrezi, on the human plane, Guru Padmasambhava. But uh, all Tibetan schools regard him as the greatest master of ancient times. And he took everything Sang Sang Gampo and the four generations following Sang Sang Gampo had done and put all of that together in a format and um, finished and re 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 refreshed, re-edited all of the translations and brought in, uh, revived all the lineages and put them together as packages that continued and come down to us today. And until today, we still have many lineages. As I say, what comes directly from him and what are inspired by dreams and meditation visions by later masters, because many of those terma texts, uh, treasure texts, are seven, eight hundred years later, a thousand years later. Uh, but nonetheless, they are held as equally true of his legacy as though he had spoken them himself. Next. And of course, so where Blavatsky was in India was uh, just uh, miles, a few miles from where he achieved enlightenment, the lake where he achieved enlightenment, the cave where he did that meditation, and so forth. It was right near where she lived and uh, did a lot of her uh, work up there. Uh, well, they have these wonderful kind of prayer wheels. And again, Blavatsky mentioned those repeatedly in her doctrine. And she even writes poems called prayer wheels inspired by the idea she would have seen them in the temples in the area, and she would have also seen them as handheld little instruments that the old people often carry when they go on pilgrimage. Uh, so a prayer will you fill it with prayers and good thoughts and uh, sort of twirl it as you, before coming into a temple, and the mantras make your prayer or your wish 100,000 times stronger. But uh, she, of course, likes to use it allegorically, or metaphorically, I should say, metaphorically for some of her poems, prayer wheels as... Uh, auspicious thoughts to guide the future and inspire the future. Next. Tibetans begin every morning with this smoke ceremony right in front of the Jokong. It's a little bit of strong on the air pollution. Anyone who doesn't like secondhand smoke, stay home. <laughs> but they take juniper, see, juniper bushes and uh, sage. They love sage for the smell of sage. And they just, uh, especially at sacred times of the year, they just fill those uh, urns so filled with smoke. And if they sow in smoke and uh, barley flour and then alcohol, because of course, it's, uh, it's for the spirits of the mountains and of the lakes and of the air. So the nature spirits, and everyone knows they love barley, they love uh, incense, and they love whiskey. So uh, everyone takes along their bottle of whiskey and their barley flour. And they love butter, so you also throw in some butter. <laughs> if you have a mountain near you, please do one of those every morning, and you'll live a happy life. <laughs> but it's very uh, wonderful atmosphere at the time, particularly if you know in, in the Sagadawa, the sacred month. It's very busy, and people begin and do walk-arounds of all the sacred places of Lhasa, and especially strong at the, around the Barkor. Morning and evening, it's shoulder to shoulder. You cannot hardly move for the pilgrims, pilgrims pushing there. So it's very, very magical. Next. And uh, even though Tibet's very high, it's, a, it's valleys are very lush. We'll be going in May, so it'll still be um, before growing season. So it'll look a little moonscapey. Um, but uh, once the rains of mid-June come, then it turns totally lush and green. and uh, this, I think, was taken mid-June. Yeah, this is uh, one of Ed Ordmont outside of Milwaukee. It came on uh, one of my trips to the Oracle Lake. And so, so everything's just starting to turn green. But nonetheless, all the valleys have glacial rivers like this. This is a Brahmaputra. 
starts uh, almost a thousand miles west at uh, Mount Kailash and winds its way all through the high plains and high deserts and comes right down through the heart of Lhasa, goes east for another few hundred miles and then pulls a right and drops down to uh, India, comes out at Calcutta. Beautiful river. It's called what? Brahmaputra. 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 The son of Brahma. <laughs> Putra is son. So next, Brahma is the creator god. And on the southern shores of that uh, river is Samye, the first monastery built in Tibet. Again, Blavatsky mentions that many times, and we'll be going there. That's of uh, the very first monastery built in Tibet. Among, there were uh, uh, Sangsen Gumbo 100 years earlier had built 108 temples, including the Jokong. Uh, the difference between a monastery and a temple is that a monastery must be three air shots from the nearest human habitation. <laughs> By old definition, it's not like that anymore. Now the definition is it just has to have five or more monks living in it. So almost any, you could call, put five monks here and uh, you could call the TS a monastery, legally. And if there were grants for monasteries, you could apply. <laughs> but in those days you could not. It had to be three air shots from the nearest non-monk human habitation. But a very beautiful place, and uh, it was, of course was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution, but this is all rebuilt since 1980. Next. To get there from Lhasa, you have to take a boat across that beautiful river, so uh, everyone bring your water wings. <laughs> Actually, now you can take a bridge and go behind and around it. You don't have to take the the boat, but the boat is a wonderful uh, experience. Just, it's about a two-hour boat ride, I guess, to get from one side to the other, even though it's not very far, but the river is, depends on the time of year, and the river has a lot of uh, channels in it. So they have to go up and down and up and down and up and down following the channels to get there. This was a group I took about three years ago to the Oracle Lake, and just by the, that fellow right there, the former husband of Joan Halifax, uh, great Zen, female Zen teacher here in America, an anthropologist. But he now has lived in England for many years, maybe 15 or so, and is a British filmmaker. And he made a documentary film for British television of our Oracle Lake quest that was released in England, I guess, uh, two, three months ago. It'll be released in America, I think, uh, mid-December, something like that. It's called Sacred Sites of the Dalai Lama's uh, Pilgrimage to the Oracle Lake. So next... Again, prayer wheels, every temple we go to, every site, sacred site we visit, always has the prayer wheels. I just wanted to show this one just because it's uh, one near Samye, and it just, uh, it kind of just shows the, the simplicity of the spiritual life. Often, you know, temples with the statues and whatnot, but the prayer wheel meditation, the morning and evening walk, I think, for Tibetans is their favorite time of day. Um, in an article I once wrote, actually for Quest magazine, uh, I pointed out that, uh, I mentioned that I once asked a Tibetan friend living in America what he missed most over here. And he said the morning and evening kora, which means walkabout or pilgrimage. Uh, every Tibetan villager has a, there's a kind of the sacred sites of the valley where the local like, you know, water sprite lives and where a tree spirit lives and then Saint, you know, some place where a great saint once sat and temples built by this or visited by that great being of the past. And they'll make a circular walk about, which usually will take about an hour to walk uh, slowly or 45 minutes to walk quickly. And every Tibetan loves every morning and evening to get up and do that quick uh, sort of walk about. For them, it's more fun than sit sitting in meditation or chanting mantras or uh, prayers. And they walk around, they spin the prayer wheels and um, in front of the most sacred places, they'll make their little wishes and sacred prayers and send their good thoughts. Next. Um, Blavatsky was most into the new school or the yellow school of Tibetan Buddhism, Lama Tsongkhapa, and his two great students of being here. I think this, this is probably... Uh, I think that, that's uh, from the Jokong, so from, that's from central Tibet. But of course, uh, she was most inspired by the Dalai and Panchen Lamas and by beings connected with them. And they, both of those Tulku lineages trace their first incarnations to direct students of Lama Tsongkhapa, who is 
pictured here, often called the Gelukpa school or the yellow hat school, or in the Far East with Mongolians, simply the golden school. Next. I guess a big uh, difference with uh, Sankapa is uh, Bob Thurman, uh, the professor father who's a president of Tibet House and he's the father of Uma Thurman, the actress, refers to it as the Ganden Renaissance. Uh, Sankapa brought in Ganden Tushita Maitreya Buddha and the whole kind of uh, artistry uh, of Maitreya, the Buddha of the future, kind of futuristic Buddhist art symbolized by Maitreya. So every time you go to a yellow temple, that's what you see, Maitreya. And again, Blavatsky mentions that connection many times, meaning she was well aware of that tradition. Next. The great monasteries near uh, Tibet, Ganden, Drepung, Sera, uh, and Taishi Lumpo, and Blavatsky mentions all of those. Drepung was the biggest. And uh, <coughs> it, in the old days, uh, Losaling held about 10,000 monks, and uh, Gomong held about 3,000. So, uh, and then they had six other trasangs just with a few hundred each. So maybe 12 to 15,000 was their average uh, population. They're about, I guess, seven, eight miles from Lhasa. So they actually equaled the total population of all of Lhasa. But uh, from the second to fifth Dalai Lamas, they always lived in here. They always lived in, in Drepung Monastery. Next. If you look out over the buildings and beside the great temples, you have all the residences. And down below, there's a beautiful apple orchard. Next. And in the old days, of course, uh, that was all just uh, farmland down below. Now, even though it's uh, 10 miles, uh, I guess, east of the city. No, 10 miles west of the city. Um, you've, it's, uh, the Chinese uh, immigration has spread all the way. Urban sprawl, urban sprawl. It's not just the bane of Chicago. <laughs> Next. That shot is from Drepung Monastery. Oh, okay. oh behind Semye is, is the great mountain complex, cave complex of Chimpu. If you look closely, you can see temples up along it. But there's a, a nunnery there with 250 nuns. And a lot of those nuns live in the caves up there meditating. That's where the first 25 Tibetans achieved enlightenment under Padmasambhava. And we're also where two, the first two Tibetans who learned how to fly learned how to fly. <laughs> And so there's a cave there that they used to practice their flying from. I mention that because my most recent book is called The Flying Mystics of Tibetan Buddhism. And I suggested to uh, Quest Books that they try and get Sir India to give them paperback rights to it, because I think it would be a lot of fun. I dedicate it to Madame Blavatsky and uh, Alexander David Neal, because uh, they sort of saw the fun in Tibetan Buddhism. And I think in the last couple of decades, most of our Tibetan Buddhism in the West has come through academics, uh, doing PhDs and their doctorates, and then becoming profs. And so it's kind of, hasn't been, it's not really so much fun anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like arguing over whether this term really means that, or is it Musum or Mishi with that, and uh, you know, self-emptiness, other emptiness, and all these kind of... Is this a really a pramana or is it not? And is this a numtok or is it just a tokpa? And it goes on and on and on. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> but anyway, so it's kind of gone in that very dry, somewhat boring direction. So I want to do an art show called The Flying Mystics of Tibetan Buddhism, and I do a reader together with it. So I did it, I did it as an art show down in Atlanta about three years ago, I guess. And the art show is now in New York. So if any of you happen to visit New York, it's in the Rubin Museum on 17th. Uh, street and 7th Avenue, pretty well about that location. Beautiful uh, museum owned by a very wealthy Jewish man who is the biggest American collector of Central Asian art, Buddhist art from Central Asia. But anyway, so he sponsored the publication. But it was published by Surindia here in Chicago. Um, but behind is this uh, Chimbu, where in the old days everyone went to meditate and do the three-year retreats. And if you're going to do a 12-year retreat, when you get to the top, you pull over a left on the pass, and you come down another uh, little valley. And you go to the top of that, and that's where they would do the 12-year retreats. So just this was for the guys doing the short retreats of just three years. But uh, the first two people learning to fly learned there. And I have a great picture uh, from a painting, of course, not to... Not to 
from a camera. We haven't got time travel to go back and shoot them yet. But of uh, the first one, the very first one, uh, Namkan Yingpo was his name, who learned to fly. And so there's a picture of him jumping out of his cave and actually flying for the first time. So they always love to hang those prayer flags. And again, Madame Blavatsky mentions that in many of her mentions prayer flags. And again, often uses it as a metaphor uh, for something, sort of, sort of a beautiful thought sent on the power of the wind to fill the whole universe. Next. My personal favorite place in uh, near Lhasa is this Drak Yerpa where the early Kadampa masters, Padmasambhava meditated for three months, Yeshi Sogyal for, I think, six years. And, but then uh, uh, Tisha and Lama Dumpa, the great Kadampa masters of the 11th century, medit here, meditated here for about five years. And it became uh, a spot where a lot of the Kadampas meditated. And therefore, all the early Dela and Panchen Lamas would go here to meditate for three or six months. And so one of my favorites. But the, on the left, the little temple complex, it's just a little temple that's been put up in front of the caves of Atisha and Lama Dramdampa, the founders of the Kadampa school. Atisha, of course, was India, Indian, coming from Bengal. In about uh, six, 1042, he came, entered Tibet, and lived there and taught until his death. Dalai Lama often says, of course, to call one thing Lamaism, he says, we Tibetans don't much like that word because it makes it sound like Lamaism is different than Buddhism. And he says, it's just Buddhism, but if there's one element that's very strong in Tibetan Buddhism that's uh, special, it's the lineages from him, and they go to all schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Next. Just looking from one of the retreat huts, I think this is the temple in front of the Guru Rinpoche cave. So Padmasambhava lived in this cave for three months, and I think Yeshe Sogyal at a later date uh, for six months. But looking up that ridge, that's, uh, again, a lot of great caves where other masters achieved enlightenment, and again, lots of prayer flags everywhere. So next. And looking down the valley from any of those caves, it just kind of drops from about 16,000 feet down to a mere 13,000 or so in next to no time, but the beautiful little mountains going straight down. And of course, one of the tributaries that goes into the Brahmaputra in the far distance. Next. <clears throat> and again, uh, that's, uh, that's all Tibetan's favorite little valley, because uh, up above there is where the seventh Dalai Lama achieved enlightenment. So that's uh, the valley where he achieved enlightenment. And as a result, everyone hangs their prayer flags there. And to get up to his cave is extremely difficult. You've got those hundreds of thousands of prayer flags. And you're not allowed to step over them. That would be inauspicious. You have to lift all those ropes like this thick of prayer flags and lift them up and go under all the way up. And of course, you know, pulls off all your buttons. And you know, when I went up, I took three or four very beautiful ladies with me so it wouldn't be complete suffering. Next. Actually, when we go, this is the first place we're going to go. We're not going to go to Lhasa. This is the uh, Yarlung Valley, and that's said to be the first castle built in Tibet, or the first palace. About 400 BC, the first, uh, perhaps the time of Buddha and the civil wars that followed in central India after Buddha's passing, it's legend that uh, a group of Indians escaped into Tibet. Uh, one of the armies running away from the fight. That particular prince was uh, very ugly, so the father always put him in like the most difficult battles, hoping to kill him off, but nothing would ever work. <laughs> so eventually, he just got fed up with it, <laughs> and during those civil wars, left and went to Tibet and settled in this valley. And uh, Tibetans asked him where he came from, and he didn't understand what they meant because he didn't speak Tibetan. And the Tibetan way, uh, Indians, if you, you say something they don't know, they go like this. Like what, do you, like, what do you mean? Like, like that? <laughs> so they thought he was pointing to the heavens, meaning he was a god who had fallen down from heaven. <laughs> so they lift him up, uh, lift him up on a, put him on a planquin and carried him on their shoulders to this mountain and declared him their king. <laughs> they thought, you know, if a god's going to drop in. Also, like me, he was a very handsome fellow. By Tibetan way of thinking, by the Indian standards, he was very ugly because apparently he had like web fingers and web feet and stuff like that, which actually in Buddhism is a, is a sign of a very high incarnation. 
but therefore he's called King Nyatri Tsempo, the king carried on a planquin. <laughs> and uh, he became the first king of the Yarlung Valley, this little valley. And uh, slowly that valley, that dynasty became more important and eventually became the main dynasty of central Tibet. All the other kings eventually um, developed an allegiance to, a, to that reigning monarch. But the 33rd, Sungsen Gampo, is the one who moved to Tibet, started the building of the Potala and so forth. And he turned this from a castle and made it into a little monastery with now, I think, six or eight or maybe ten monks live in it and meditate there. But very beautiful. And you have to go up that walkway. But if you're not up to it, there are horses and a camel and a yak uh, down below. You can take your uh, choice of the kind of conveyance you would like. I think here we're kind of yak folks, right? So we'll, we'll go for the yaks. Next. But it is a very beautiful, uh, beautiful little monastery or temple. Again, it was completely destroyed in the Cultural Revolution uh, by China, but uh, has been rebuilt since. Next. Next. And next. Up behind the temple, all the way to the peak, of course, you get this wonderful uh, array of prayer flags and the such. So next. Then the next few shots are just kind of when you travel from... Tibet is essentially... 400 kingdoms that uh, in ancient times were a loose federation, each with its own king, and with the Dalai Lamas as kind of the spiritual peacemakers, and the Tibetan government in Lhasa as a kind of a central you know, switching office, keeping uh, everything in working well, you know, famines here or problems there, trying to kind of keep it all working harmoniously. But each one was pretty independent. Each of those valleys had its own king, its own uh, reincarnate lama, kind of like a Dalai Lama, and uh, its own great, uh, you know, a lot of them had a little bit of their own way of speaking, you know, like Milwaukee accent compared to Chicago, compared to Bronx, compared to Brooklyn kind of thing. Sometimes even a little more different than that. But as you drive from one to another, you go up these wonderful mountain passes with beautiful vistas. Because this is in uh, June, so you know the crops are up and it's green. When we're there, I'm not sure if it will or will not yet be green. But the, the advantage of when we're going, and the reason why we're going earlier is because that's the sacred month. Because it's not green, people haven't uh, done much farming yet. Uh, the pilgrims are out in full force, and it's the, it's the holy month for the Tibetans, so everyone it's all the temples are full, and the monks are banging drums and chanting, and you've got a lot of uh, you know, temple dances, the mask dances, and all of those kind of things in the month of May. <clears throat> so we're, we're trying to time it for that rather than for the flowers of the greenery summer. Those of you who like, you can come back in the summer. Next. So these, again, they're just like beautiful mountain passes. This is Potala, I think, the, the Pota Pass. And uh, I think it's about 18,000 feet or something like that. It's fairly intense. And when you get up, you're looking down like a very little muddy road. And if it's raining, it's totally muddy and slippery. And it's like one lane. And if you meet someone coming the other way, someone has to back up till you find a place that's almost two lanes. And you kind of inch by one another like that. So it's very dramatic. But we're not going to those passes. Ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> the next. <laughs> but we're going over many beautiful mountain passes. And uh, the ones, like we're, we're going from uh, down by the Turquoise Lake and down to Gyeongsae. That's, we get two very beautiful glacial passes that way. But the road there is a better finish. It's actually paved road all the way. They just finished it this year. 2008 being Olympic year, China has tried to pave every road from an airport to every main place and to clear both sides of the street and make it look beautiful and civilized on both sides of the street. Anywhere in China, you go 100 yards off of that, of course, it's quite different. So next. 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 So just kind of beautiful vistas you get as you drive. So this is one of the passes. They do this kind of thing on the mountain passes. Next. Uh, next. The Oracle Lake, which is the uh, subject of the film we made, but you come up to the next. You sit on this kind of man natural man-made ridge about a quarter of a mile above and look down into the water, and you get your vision from there. 
But they go there to looking for the reincarnations of all Dalai Lamas and Panchen Lamas. So next. And far west, Kailash, that's traveling from Lhasa out to where Blavatsky uh, spent her time. So had she gone to Tibet, this is how she would have gone. This is the road she would have taken. Next. Next. I don't know who that handsome fellow is. <laughs> anyway, that river, that the reason, one of the reasons why that is so sacred, Shiva achieved enlightenment there in the Hindu tradition, but also the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Indus, and the Sulche rivers all, find, all are sourced on that mountain. And they flow from there in four directions. So India and Pakistan, their two main rivers, come from that mountain. But uh, it's been a great meditation spot, not only for Hindus and Buddhists, but also for Eastern Persians, the Zoroastrians, for the Bunpos, or pre-Buddhists of ancient Tibet, uh, the shamans of ancient Tibet, the Taoists of Western China, and the shamans of Mongolia for many, many millenniums, actually. So very sacred. So next, uh, the lake where uh, Shiva's uh, Parvati sat in a cold lake meditating, trying to win his heart. Of course, we men were very cool, distant, and even though she was beautiful. He didn't move his meditation at all, but she sat in there for two years. He was impressed. <laughs> they got married and had some kids. <laughs> One of whom is, of course, Ganesh, of the famous Ganesh uh, fame. And uh, that became the source of the Hindu tantras. That's about 500 years after the Buddhist tantras. So in Buddhism, we say Buddhists gave the tantras to the Hindus. We gave it to the Hindus, giving to Ganesh. It was the first to get the Shiva Paranas. Next. And when we came down, everyone were like walking and coming over a pass 18,600 feet. We're feeling a little tired. But these uh, grandmas did it prostrating full body length all the way. You take a stone and stretch out and put it down. Take two steps, bow down, bend down, pick up your stone. Take a, another prostration, put it down, stand back up. Take another two steps, bend down. They went all the way up that 18,600 foot pass and all the way down the other side. And here they're going across a river that's uh, the ice is slightly melting here, so it's very wet. <laughs> like uh, your feet, your, sh your shoes get totally wet from the water, but didn't uh, disturb them. They just kept going. So next. And next. You know, just some of the other uh, great old monasteries in the Sakya tradition. So just Lama dances happening at them. And again, um, Blavatsky discusses those sacred dances, so would have been, must have experienced them somewhere. Next. Next. This one monastery we were at, this young Lama had just, his uh, reincarnation had just been discovered. So it was very, very wonderful. And he was actually the guru of the seventh Dalai Lama. So I feel a very strong connection to him. And like you know, his predecessor, his first reincarnation was a guru of the seventh Dalai Lama. And his uh, previous to previous reincarnation was a fellow who identified the present Dalai Lama. So I felt very honored to meet him just by chance. And uh, well, I had a camera with me, and the police came up and said, there's no cameras allowed. And I said, yes, yes. But when I got in front of him, I said, uh, Rinpoche, would uh, um, you know, I'm a big fan of the Seventh Dalai Lama and of your first incarnation and also of the retting who discovered the present Dalai Lama. Do you mind if I take your picture? And he says, not at all. So then he, I took his picture. And of course, the police grabbed me and took me in the back and said, this is very bad. Where's your passport? You're going to be arrested. Da -da -da -da. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't bring my passport with me. <laughs> Well, anyway, you're going to be arrested. Who doesn't bring their passport? I said, I don't, because there's a lot of thieves in these places. <laughs> it says, you police, you don't do such a good job. There's not enough police here. You should be looking for thieves. <laughs> so they scolded me for about an hour. And I said, no, no, I'm very sorry, but you said no. But he said yes. So who am I supposed to believe? Who are you? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> He said, we'll confiscate your camera. And I said, no, you will not. <laughs> the thing is with the, those, those uh, the communist uh, authorities and all the communist places is to be firm, fair, humorful, and not at all insulting. You can't be insulting. But anyway, he let me keep my camera and my photograph. And this is the one. And Rinpoche just came out beautiful in it. I think he's just seven years old. And this was his coming out. This was his first public event. 
since his enthronement, since he was recognized about six or eight months ago. So next. Yes, so uh, this is a, a good friend of uh, Ruth Ann Fowler Hare. I put it in purposely thinking Ruth Ann would be a Hare, but uh, a friend of hers, her car, uh, had, a, had a problem with her car about an hour ago, like half an hour before the talk. So she comes running in and says, oh, Glenn, I'm so sorry, I have to run. But I put this in for her. But also to show you guys, you see, if you don't want to walk, we can put you on a camel up some of those mountain passes, or a horse, or a yak. And for those of you who are used to driving like Volkswagens and Toyotas, they even rent donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> oh, yeah, this, uh, these are the last two pictures. I always, uh, when I travel, I always uh, meet people who say, oh, yes, uh, can you find a sponsor for my child? Da, da, da. So this little girl here, it's a single mom. Uh, she's a waitress in a restaurant in Lhasa. And anyway, she's a single mom. And the next picture. This is a very sweet little girl. Anyway, if anyone likes to have a foster sponsor a little girl in Lhasa, uh, you can phone up and chit chat and uh, say hello once a month or whatever, because they, they actually have phones in Lhasa. Unfortunately, in Tibet, uh, if you're not a member of the, and in uh, most of China, if you're not a member of the Communist Party, there's no free schooling. So if you have kids, they don't get to go to school for free. You have to uh, spend like $30 a month for your school fee. and. Uh, which is kind of amazing in a communist country. You'd think that education and medicine would be free, but neither is free in communist China. And so, you know, she probably, as the mom, probably makes uh, 60 $70 a month as a, as a waitress in a restaurant. And a uh, very beautiful, young, and intelligent young girl. So I thought, uh, wherever I go, I'll put a picture at the end. If anyone says, hey, I like that kid, I'll sponsor her for $20, $30, $40 a month. Then I'll give you the mom's address, and you can uh, phone up and do it. And if you don't, then you, at least you get to see a pretty, uh, a very delightful young lady. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope that uh, was a little bit of an introduction to Blavatsky's Tibet. It's certainly the Tibet I love. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I think uh, Blavatsky made references to all those places and all those traditions in you know, her own writings. And uh, so I wanted to show some of it. We won't be going to all those places on our tour. Like, uh, I don't think we're going to have Mount Kailash or Mount Everest or those kind of places. But nonetheless, we will be going to many of the, the central ones. Uh, we will be staying in hotels everywhere rather than tenting. So people who don't like tenting don't have to worry about uh, rocks under your mattress and things like that. Thank you so much. If anyone has anything, questions or points you want to bring up, OK. Also, at the back, there's some of my books. And anyone buys any, I'll happily sign. And as for the bric-a-brac that's for sale there, uh, that's for the America Mongolia Friendship Society. These days, I keep an apartment in Mongolia. And I try to help with the rebuilding under 75 years under Soviets. Uh, there was great destruction of Mongolia. And so now everything's being rebuilt, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, difficulties, of course, challenges in that rebuilding. So uh, I had the, good, the great honor to bring over a Mongolian art exhibit for Atlanta last year. Parts of it now are actually up in New York at the Rubin Museum. And uh, anyway, so uh, I did that basically to try to get more attention to Mongolia and to the need to rebuild that center part of the world. In the past, I think Mongolia was one of the great civilizations of Asia, still is, like uh, Chinggis Khan, for instance brought us the zero. We did not have zero before Genghis Khan in our Western mathematics. So we were rather challenged before Genghis Khan. No zero. We also didn't have carrots. <laughs> and if you like carrots, thanks, thanks to Genghis Khan for opening the Silk Road. Uh, we also didn't have, uh, he, he was he's often thought as, as the first emperor to proclaim both religious freedom. And there was no, uh, no religious bias. He himself had teachers from all schools, although he considered himself primarily a shaman and a Buddhist, but he always kept Christian teachers in his court, uh, Taoist teachers, and even a Hindu teacher from India. Um, if any of his ruled places, uh, they had religious fights or feuds, he'd go in and cut off heads on both sides just to show that he wasn't showing preference. <laughs> uh, so he was a firm but fair guy. And uh, he, of course, brought the end of the Dark Ages in Europe. You know, For 800 years, we had been languishing under the Dark Ages, like if a woman so much as showed a slight mystical sign, she was uh, either drowned or burned at the stake. And if she was thrown in the water, if she drowned, then it meant she was innocent. But if she came to the top, it meant she was a witch and was very often uh, killed. 
Um, we had uh, terrible, we call it the Dark Ages because it was so rough, rough. but uh, opening the Silk Road and bringing in those, uh, a kind of a court democracy that he introduced where, um, for instance, when he conquered a land, only the, the, he always sent negotiators before invading. That was kind of a new idea for people. Uh, very few, seldom did people negotiate first because it meant you had hostile intentions. It's always better to have the sneak attack. He never relied upon the sneak attack. He'd always send negotiators and try and make peace before uh, anything, before the conflict went the other way. Then he also always went to his mountain and did, th did three days of meditation and prayer to look for an alternate path to violence. So then when he conquered, he didn't harm the people, only those, uh, the, only those responsible for the decision of not making the, tr the trade treaty. So wherever it did go the other way, it was because they murdered his uh, ambassadors. And that, then, then he got a little tough. So he was a little tough in Kiev. He was a little tough in Herat and also in Damascus because they murdered his ambassadors. When I told that story, uh, uh, when I gave a talk in the American embassy in Mongolia before my art exhibit was coming over to get the ambassador and uh, the cultural officer to help, I said, you know, he never liked anyone to murder his ambassadors. And uh, Pamela Slutz, the uh, American ambassador at the time, stood up and said, we also don't like that <laughs> when people <laughs> murder the ambassadors. So anyway, uh, the, whatever people get from there, you make the check out to the America Mongolia Friendship Society. It's on the piece of paper, and it helps uh, some Mongolia projects. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, and we appreciate all the work you do for the Mongolian project and the Tibetan people. Um, so uh, Saturday, I would remind you that we are that Glenn will be teaching esoteric Buddhist techniques from Tibet and Mongolia, and this will be a practical guide to self-illumination through. 84,000 ways to enlightenment. I don't think you'll cover quite all of those, but I think it should be a very um, inspiring day of instruction, meditation, mantra, and power yoga. Um, also based on the seventh Dalai Lama, who is oral tradition, who is your favorite. Um, and the, the brochures are downstairs on the, the um, tour that uh, Glenn is leading, and I look forward to it myself very much. Thank you. We do not have time for more questions, but uh, we appreciate all the information and the lovely pictures. Thank you so much.